Hello everyone, and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Thank you to all the sponsors of our Startup and Innovation series. We would like to remind everyone that the Q&A feature will be available, so feel free to send in those questions for the panelists throughout the discussion. And with that, I will throw it over to our moderator who joins us from Nixon Guilt Law, Carrie Nixon. Hello everyone, it's great to be with you. I'm gonna ask our panelists to turn on their cameras and uh, as well so they can join us and you can see their lovely faces this morning. Um, I appreciate the foundation inviting me to moderate this panel. I'm very excited about it. Uh, my, health, my law firm is focused exclusively on healthcare innovation. And we are joined today by three amazing innovators. The first is Dr. Melinda Henderson. She is the Chief Medical Officer of CareBridge. And CareBridge uses innovative technology tools to improve the lives of people receiving long-term care services in their home. We are also joined by Jessica Kim, who is the co-founder and the CEO of IonaCare, which is a comprehensive platform that equips family caregivers with the tools, resources, and care coaches to effectively mobilize support in the home. And last but not least, we're joined by Dr. Afik Gal, the co-founder of uh, Assured Allies. Assured Allies is, is, ensures successful aging through evidence-based intervention and provides one-on-one -on -one engagement with its, with its patients and customers. So now that we've gotten uh, the, the, the conversation set, let's dive in and hear a little bit more from each of these participants about what their companies do how they're innovating and how they're helping to improve lives. Let me start with Melinda. Melinda, uh, you have been with CareBridge for some time now, although CareBridge is a young company. It was, it was founded in 2020. Have you been involved since the beginning? I sure have. Yeah, CareBridge, um, as you said, started, we actually started in 2019. We started okay. providing clinical services in 2020 um, and I've been involved since, uh, since the Really, the idea came uh, early on in 2019. So what drove your involvement? Um, the main thing is we are uh, meeting a need that uh, didn't exist before. So I have been throughout my career involved in um, Medicaid from the health plan side. I was uh, a medical director with United Healthcare for a number of years. Um, and then as a provider, I have done um, a lot of clinical work for both elderly, I'm a geriatrician um, and individuals with disability. Um, and what CareBridge sought to do, you, you already stated our mission was to uh, improve the lives of individuals receiving home and community-based services. So this is a very uh, distinct pop part of the population that um, is on Medicaid and receiving services in their home. Uh, and this part of the population has had a, a major issue with access to care and often finds themselves having to take an emergency room uh, visit for something that could potentially be simply treated at home. Um, and so we uh, set out to provide technology to the home of these individuals um, and a care team and, and physician practice associated with that technology um, to improve their lives and to um, provide services to them. So are your services limited to Medicaid uh, beneficiaries or, or are, you, are you broader than that? Uh, right now uh, it is Medicaid. We have a large population of uh, individuals that are duly enrolled in Medicare and Medicaid. Um, that's a, about 80% of the individuals that we serve, um, but as a core component, they all also have Medicaid. And you mentioned that all of these individuals are receiving long-term care services in their homes. Is that usually in the form of, uh, you know, through a, through a home health agency or does it take other forms as well? Uh, most of them are receiving care through a, um, a, a, a caregiving agency. They're not always um, technically home health, but a caregiving agency that's providing um, a caregiver in the home, a paid caregiver in the home. Some of them also um, are signed up for what they call consumer direct or self-direct services, where they're hiring their own worker, so not necessarily through an agency. Um, but yeah, that is a core thread as well as all, um, all of these individuals have um, some type of home and community-based services, um, typically a caregiver in their home. So tell us a little bit about these innovative technology tools that you're, that you're using with CareBridge. 
Yeah, very simply, um, we provide a cellular enabled um, tablet in their home that has a very simple interface that allows for, um, uh, in some states, that allows the workers to check in and check out through EBV, which is a requirement of Medicaid caregiving services. Um, but more importantly, or, or that, that service has existed for forever. So the new service that we added to it um, was easy access to a care team. So literally with the press of a button, they can um, access a care team. Um, the CareBridge care team is physicians, nurses, social workers, pharmacists, um, and then we have a whole um, kind of engagement team. Um, uh, so they can, at a press of a button, um, get care immediately. Um, they can do what we call a health status survey, which is answer simple questions about how they're feeling um, so that we can proactively reach out and try to prevent that next hospitalization or increased care need. Um, and then we have other tools where we can um, upload documents to the tablet so they can see maybe their care plan or um, if there's some teaching videos. Um, the tablet has other um, kind of ways that we can interact with that individual and provide either teaching documents or um, uh, schedules, calendars, things like that through the technology. But the, the two major uses um, are, um, are to access the care team and to chat with the care team. Excellent, excellent. So thank you for that overview, Melinda. Yeah. Let's, let's turn to Jessica and hear a little bit about Ionicare. Jessica, you are the founder and the CEO. Tell me what was your inspiration behind Ionicare? Well, my co-founder Steve Lee and I um, were just both thrust into family caregiving ourselves. So um, we've both been tech entrepreneurs. Uh, I've been in the direct-to-consumer space. He's a tech genius doing you know, AI and um, amazing things, uh, uh, speech recognition. Um, but, uh, in, you know, my mom had pancreatic cancer for seven and a half years and I had three kids, 10, seven and five at that time. I was working full time and I was thrust into this role where, um, you know, she and my dad moved in with me and I got to the point where I had to quit my job and be her full time caregiver. And, uh, it was the hardest and least time of my life. And I just was super frustrated, um, as after she passed away. And in my deep grief, I just realized this, that this is a completely overlooked role um, and that something really had to be done. Yeah, it's amazing how many um, inspirations for very successful and very impactful companies come from personal experience. Um, I think there, there's an element in that um, behind every sort of early stage company, but for you, Jessica, in particular, uh, I'm sure that resonates with, with yeah. many, many people. Sandwich, the sandwich generation um, struggles for sure. They actually so, call it panini generation now because it's not only sandwich, you're actually fried and oozing on all sides. <laughs> wow, that's a visual. That's a visual. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's great. So um, had you been in the healthcare space prior to founding Ionicare? No, um, actually, uh, and I actually think that's one of our advantages that we're really bringing this very uh, consumer human centered approach to it. Of course, we're working with experts in the field and of course the clinical side is hugely important. But um, as we looked and talked to, as we talk about care, what we realized is what often gets overlooked is the critical role of that family caregiver, especially for those who cannot care for themselves. And so the stats of like one out of seven people in the U.S. alone are diagnosed with the condition where they become reliant on a family caregiver. So Alzheimer's, cancer, aging, disabilities, um, chronic conditions. And when we think about these conditions, we typically think about the clinical side. And it's, of course, so important. Um, but what we have thought about it is like over 90 percent of the actual time being cared for happens in the home not in the hospital and they're typically led by family caregivers. Yeah. Um, there are 54 million family caregivers in the US. Um, they do $470 billion worth of care every single year. We always say that they are the invisible backbone to our whole entire healthcare system and society. And yet they are unsupported, unpaid and untrained. Um, yeah. yeah. And Huge. So yeah, a, a huge, a huge problem. So you talk about effectively, mo you know, mobilizing support for those caregivers, right? Which is obviously critical. What does that support look like? Yeah. So, I mean, when we ask, okay, what do family caregivers need help with most? Then you say they need all, all the help with the non-clinical aspects of care as they partner with the clinical side. And so it's all the social determinants of health that really do impact over 80% of the health outcome. Um, and our aha moment was that 
Uh, you know, all there are thousands of resources and services that exist, but it's highly fragmented, completely underutilized, and it's not really built for the end user in the home to navigate on their own. And so that's really where we come in. So Ionicare is one platform that organizes and mobilizes all the different layers of support needed at some point in every caregiver and patient's journey. So everything from personal social circles, so your friends and family, however big or small, that impacts your daily care. Mm -hmm. um, local resources, everything from condition specific services, um, transportation, food security, financial aid. Uh, and then you have, uh, we work with employers and health plans to put all their benefits and programs all in one place. So you don't have to go to all these different portals. And then we match you with a one-on-one -on -one, uh, caregiver coach and navigator to help you walk through um, you know, how to actually implement all of those resources. And so we put it all in one place in a very easy to use intuitive platform. Yeah, so the one-stop aspect I'm sure is invaluable to caregivers who are otherwise overwhelmed with figuring out how and where to get resources. That's amazing. So Afik, let's talk a little bit about Assured Allies. You talk about successful aging through evidence-based interventions. Tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, you're a co-founder as well. Tell me a little bit about what drove you to start Assured Allies and, and uh, you know, talk about these evidence-based interventions that you mentioned. Yeah, so great. Thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you for organizing this. I think this is a really important conversation to, to be had. And, and, and I think the story is pretty much the story of a lot of people that are ended up in this industry. That's a personal story. So it wasn't as bad of a story as Jessica described. But for me, I had to aging. I've been in healthcare for the past 20 years, healthcare technology. I've been involved with many technical project, clinical projects, sold to payers, providers, been very deep in the ecosystem and understood its limitations and really wanted to start something that is not exactly healthcare, but did not know exactly what. And suddenly I kind of realized that I'm spending more and more time talking with my friends and talking my, with my co-founder about our aging parents or aging grandma and I realized that even though I am a physician and I've had some basic knowledge of internal medicine and so on and so forth, that doesn't really um, provide all of the answers, to say the least. Mm -hmm. and, and then we started a very thorough process around what's really, what is the, really the problem here? And clearly there are many problems as we've already seen. There are a lot of resources, they are unutilized and there are a lot of other things, but what we really felt is that this entire industry, uh, which is, uh, we were very attracted to the financial part of it. So financial solutions to support successful aging because successful aging is expensive, okay? And it's expensive both in terms, even if some services are free, un unfortunately, by the way, most of them are free for Medicaid uh, people and not free for anybody else, but that's a different story altogether but it's a very expensive problem. And, and then both from the cost of the support that you need, but also from kind of getting the guidance that you need to do what is right for you. So our inclination was to try to figure out a path into this problem that will use data and will use technology, which is where areas of me and my co-founder had a lot of experience with will help navigate that space, both in terms of understanding and projecting the aging trajectory of an individual, understanding when they are gonna fall off the wagon before that happens. And it doesn't matter if it's the age of 55, 60, 65, all the way to 80, 85. And, and then try to bring to them the resources that, and, and by the way, we do not own the resources. We do not operate all of those resources. We clearly have an ecosystem partnerships-based strategy. So we partner with companies, apps, services, technologies, whatever. And we just try to make sure that first we get the right solution to the right individuals and the right solution has in our mind go through this evidence-based uh, step. So... There are many unfortunate things out there and that are not uh, that, actually the majority. Um, and second, we also believe that, um, it's more than believe, is we be, we, we've shown that this can also 
so like those interventions, this changing the trajectory can actually become a business model and that companies that partner with us and we focus mostly on the insurance space, on the private insurance space, not the healthcare insurance, it's, it's the long-term care insurance space. It, that can mean a significant changes in their bottom line for them, whether through savings on existing policies or whether through sales of new policies. And, and our really focus is on using the analytics, using the technology to tie it all together into a compelling package that will be a win-win for both the policyholders, those that purchase those products that are essentially getting the promise of successful aging and all of the support that they need from whenever they purchase until till they die and, and also make this something that the insurance companies can embed into their offerings without a need to do essentially almost anything. And we, we take care of all of that ecosystem and solution for them. So it's a bit of a different approach from many of the companies, including uh, the two examples we've heard, but I think it actually complements it pretty well and, and stems from the same motivation. That's right. I think it's a really interesting synergy between, you know, the, the insurance companies and, and the beneficiaries that they're, they're working with. So that's, that's terrific. So I want to shift gears for a moment and pose to our panelists here uh, some questions that have occurred to me as I've listened to, uh, to them talk about their companies and, um, you know, thought about uh, some things that might be interesting for this audience. So I'll ask everyone to unmute themselves um, and anyone can jump in on these questions. Uh, we'll, we'll just do a couple at a time. So the first one uh, centers around the intersection of technology and home care. So those two terms are ones that we aren't necessarily used to seeing together in the same sentence. Um, having said that, the use of technology to facilitate, to facilitate care at home is slowly becoming a more familiar concept, you know, particularly in light of COVID. What do you all think is really driving that change? I'll start. I think um, certainly uh, that the cost of technology and access to technology is just so much more prevalent, right? So um, the ease to have technology in the home is one driver. Um, and then just as the, you know, as we, as the, the folks that I hire now, the young folks, they only know technology since they've been, you know, in existence. So the familiarity with technology, it's not so scary anymore, even with our oldest um, patients, either they themselves are, you know, have had a smartphone and can connect, or they have somebody in their lives who um, is comfortable enough that they are able, able to, to get on and connect. And, you know, then we've been able to make technology super simple. So even if, if neither of those things exist, we can easily walk them through. So I think, you know, just the, the obviously the cost we can, you know, it's not cost prohibitive to send a tablet out to every one of our patients. Um, and then the, the ongoing familiarity uh, that we're seeing technology used across, you know, so many industries, but fortunately it's making its well way, not just into healthcare, but into home care. Sure. And sort of the, the you know, the notion of getting used to uh, using technology as associated with healthcare is only going to continue uh, to grow. And in fact, it's going to become, I suspect, the expectation uh, yeah. for those that are in maybe the, the age cohort of, of uh, those of us on this panel. Um, you know, so, so it's not surprising to see it trickling down right now. Um, anyone else? Yeah. So, so the way we can uh, think about this, because we, we do evaluate a lot of technologies and a lot of companies and see whether we can partner with them to, to really enhance the solutions. But we kind of split this, first we split this by age uh, groups and clearly a lot of things are moving a lot easier and the younger aging adults are like the 55, 60, 65 plus than the 80 years old where we don't see a lot of progress at all. But more broadly, I think that we, we do distinction between simple technology and more sophisticated technology. And I think, for example, using a tablet to document, using a tablet to call, these days also using a tablet to start the Zoom conferences is, is already becoming the simpler side. And I think for the simpler side, there is familiarity, there is adoption, there is essentially society expectations around those type of things. So when you're um, 
and, and not to mention COVID, by the way, which is a separate thing, but just think about Amazon. So you expect everything, you go in the app, you get it the day after. So why would you expect things to be different around that? So I think as far as simple technology, clearly there are society changes, accessibility of technology and expectations that are changing. And I would also say that there is a little bit of a hype cycles and funding that's pushing this a bit quicker than it really is accelerating. And I think you can see pretty well what's happening with telemedicine and COVID, that the numbers really soar through the roof, but now they are bouncing back pretty nicely uh, despite uh, the fact. Now, I'm not saying telemedicine is going away. I'm not saying I'm against it by hell, no, but it's very positive, but we still need to a generation needs to pass by for more adoption of technology. However, what is really unfortunate to, in my mind is that the most sophisticated technology, and I think probably the least sophisticated of that is remote patient monitoring and all of those things that people are pushing. Those are, in my mind, only becoming more familiar for specific niches, specific use cases, specific problems. I would say home hospital is a great one. Um, but other than that, it's very, very uh, limited. And unfortunately, by the way, there is a lot of hype and funding pressures on that area that make it look much more than it is. But if you actually look at results or the outcomes and distribution and all of those type of things, unfortunately, that's much, much uh, weaker. So I think we need to be cognizant of what's really a signal and what's really a signal that comes from PR companies slash investors and so on. Yeah, excellent. All right, thank you. So, so um, I wanna talk for a moment about the different types of populations that you all serve and how you manage meeting what may often be the very different needs of those different populations. Jessica, do you want to start? Sure. Um, and so for us, you know, our focus is, you know, it's the, any situation that really requires a level of clinical care, but it also demands a lot of non-clinical support in the home. And so, um, you know, we really have two major use cases. There's a rallying use case and the, one of the most uh, common examples of this is something like cancer of someone of any age, um, where friends and family really want to rally to support, you know, our system is it takes less than 45 seconds to fill out these fields, you can request meals, rides, respite care, child care, pet care, house errands. Um, we have teams that have grown to as large as 50 to 200 supporters, um, and they've really truly become this community care outside of the hospital. Um, and so there's a rallying case. And then the other use case is really project management where um, a common use case for this is aligned more with the long-term care situations, um, Alzheimer's, dementia, children or adults with special needs or elder care. Um, teams tend to be smaller. They're about like 10 people, um, but they heavily tap into the local resource database by punching a zip code across the country and getting services like the transportation and care centers. Um, and then all the health plan and employee benefits that are all integrated. Um, and then in both, you know, our care coaches and navigators really are personally matched to really walk them through everything from immediate problem solving, uh, you know, I need backup care, I need professional care, um, to mid to long term financial and legal planning. Um, and then the side that often gets overlooked, but is very important when we talk about home care is all the emotional sides of care, family dynamics, um, burnout, uh, a, reluctant, a, a, a reluctant patient. You know, these are real dynamics that become true roadblocks in the home that often doesn't appear in the hospital. Um, and so these situations I just mentioned are very different, um, but what we've realized is that at least for us in serving family caregivers, the layers and sources of this type of support are the same. And so this is the power of technology. This is where you have the same sources, but based on the UI and the UX and the data that you collect and the more that you can curate and personalize it, the more they use it, it really becomes a personalized experience, even though it's a very different situation. Um, and so that's how we've been utilizing technology to kind of make it personal. Yeah, the personalized experience aspect I love. And I think I'm, I'm sure that you're, you're customers you know, love that as well because everyone does have individual needs. So Melinda, when, you, um, when we talk about you know, technology tools for caregivers, 
we might be talking about family, you know, family members. Mm -hmm. We could be talking about a paid caregiver. Mm -hmm. We could be talking about, you know, the clinical person who's coming into the home, right, to provide care services. Do your tech, do your technology tools at CareBridge span across those different categories? Yes, exactly. So we've we've made our interface and our technology um, accessible to anybody in the home who can reach out on behalf of that individual for assistance or help with their care. So um, the primary users are um, are the patient themselves, um, non-paid caregivers or family and natural supports, um, and then paid caregivers. But um, we've had um, interactions with home health nurses that are in the home. Um, with uh, we've been on the on the video when there's EMT in the home and um, trying to help um, sort through a situation. So um, certainly the um, our population are anybody that's in the home that is supporting the individual that we're serving. Excellent. So let's talk about challenges in this space. Um, I think the the aging services space almost by definition has a host of challenges. But what are the biggest challenges that you all have faced in driving adoption of tech tools to facilitate care at home? And those can be, those can take the form of practical challenges. I think you mentioned, I think, you know, adoption of technology, which can be sometimes difficult um, for, for older folks, but practical challenge or challenges or even regulatory or policy challenges. I think you want to take that one? Yeah, yeah, great. Uh, so I think that when we look at successful aging as a whole and, and therefore plugging into what we do, I think our biggest kind of like the aha moment for us was really, really about the fact that not many, and caregiving is a great example, is not many people really want to put money behind this to help caregiving, okay? Even employers these days maybe a bit more and with COVID things are a bit different, but companies are not really jumping on this wagon and seeing that as a financial opportunity as a business model for them. And, and I think that creating a sustainable business opportunity around these topics or in, in taking it away from the, not, not anything bad against that, but taking it away from all of the services that are just dedicated at Medicaid, like the councils of aging and all of those type of things and going broader than that, I think it is really, really critical. And in my view, this is not a regulatory or a policy change, although one can say that policy could address all of those type of things, but those take a long time. We feel like this is an immediate business opportunity and, and this is where we focus a lot of our efforts. And I think this is also where we have a huge momentum and great strides on. I would probably say that's the biggest a challenge. The others, the other big ones are you know, tech adoption in the older ages, yes, it's better since COVID because people don't have a choice, but it's not, and, and it's better in terms of, I don't know, telemedicine or something like that, but I'm not sure it's going to be long lasting uh, effect or it's going to dramatically uh, change, but it's going to be better. But I, I do think that regulation and especially from my area, which is the insurance regulation, um, is still a, once again, you see a lot of desire to change. You see a lot of desire to push forward, especially with some more advanced regulators. But bottom line, there are still states in the US that are lagging substantially in their understanding of how helpful this could be to their, to the policyholders and others are and are essentially blocking almost any innovation in these spaces, the long-term care insurance space. I think. Healthcare is in a much, much better space, a much better place as far as that, and which is pretty ridiculous because we are a lot, many times trying to do very similar things to what's being done in healthcare. So. Mm -hmm. But bottom line, I think that there is a lot of desire and interest from some regulators to move forward on this, but still there are quite a few hurdles that are out there. And um, I would probably say that they are the second biggest hurdle that is, is, is gonna be hard and, and tedious and long to address after the, the, the cracking the business uh, uh, opportunity one. Yeah, it's interesting because it seems intuitive that employers would, would um, see the value in alleviating some stress on their employees around coordination, you know, coordinating care and being sure that 
their elderly parents, for example, you know, have the right care that they need. Um, but, but I think you're right, Afik, the business, the, the, you know, the business case is probably not resonating as much as it could or should be. Hopefully that will change in the future. Melinda and Jessica, thoughts on additional challenges? Well, I, I'm eager to jump in here because I actually feel like pre-pandemic, you know, pandemic is awful, obviously, for so many reasons. Um, but the thing from the pandemic is that is it accelerated the awareness of all the care that happens in the home. So, you know, we started Ayana Care pre-pandemic. And I will tell you, you're right. You were like, hey, caregivers are out there. Do you pay attention to them? And unless you've gone through it, you don't really understand really the journey of all that happens. Mm -hmm. But since then, we have seen tremendous momentum, allocation of resources, inbound requests, because the way we work is completely changing. Everyone like return to work, remote work, you cannot take care of your employee unless you understand what their care needs are. Um, and because everything is integrated. So the way we live, work and care is completely changing. So this is absolutely a moment in time where caregiving is, uh, and the home care is actually has a high, uh, like uh, uh, is being highlighted right now. So we have to like, you know, leverage this momentum um, and, you know, uh, work with all the key agencies and um, to really make this change. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think there is a budget and there's a need and there's an awareness. Um, and so we just, the tech tools, you know, will come first um, after, you know, the acknowledgement of the problem. Yeah, I wanna underscore your point about seizing the momentum. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely, we've seen an increase in momentum around all of these issues. And it is really important that, um, you know, we, we don't go backwards, right? We don't go back to, to business as usual or, or normal times. Um, and, you know, I see in, in the clients that I work with um, some lack of coordination between agencies um, with policies that they're promulgating and, and how those things interact together as, as a potential, you know, challenge, certainly that, that we're going to have to overcome. And I think from sort of a regulatory and policy perspective, as well as from a business model perspective, we need to, to be thinking in the mindset that, you know, what we just experienced over the past year and a half uh, with COVID is something that we need to be prepared for and we should take away sort of the lessons that we, that we learned there. Melinda, did you want to add any uh, additional yeah. challenges? I would I would just add on to the regulatory um, mm -hmm. topic is that the the all the things that are in place because of the public health emergency about telehealth are clearly things that we um, support because it you know I, I think we it allows us to do a lot of the work that we can do um, to to help support individuals in their home and frankly we've seen people you know less inclined people don't want to go to the ER they'd rather have an option where they can get treatment at home um, and so you know it would be lovely to see the things that are in place now that allow us to do what we do extend even beyond the public health emergency. The other kind of technology uh, kind of barrier that we um, had to try to overcome was really the digital divide. So if you think about um, kind of access to technology um, with the population that we're serving, which is Medicaid, which are um, you know, primarily folks who qualify for Medicaid because of, uh, you know, meeting some level of poverty qualification, there's also um, a general lack of access to technology. And so that's one of the reasons why it was really important to us not to just develop an app, but to how do we get that into the hands of people who don't have a smartphone or, you know, who, who don't have access to technology. And so, um, you know, we're going to, we're continuing to work on ways to, to make sure that that, um, uh, that barrier is overcome through either provision of tablets um, from us or, or other solutions that we can come up with. Yeah, and you know, broad, lack of access to broadband, in particular in rural areas, uh, is is obviously something that we need to continue to address. I know the FCC has been, uh, you know, has put sort of forward some significant grant money to facilitate, you know, broadband in conjunction with care services and. Uh, that effort, you know, while good needs to be increased and, and continue as well, because obviously we can't, you know, it is much harder to uh, make the most of tech tools if you can't um, adequately get, you know, have access to, to them, them for the yep. population. <laughs> yeah, that need the most. Exactly, exactly. 
Okay, so let's, um, I'm interested to hear from each of you, you know, what kinds of tech tools in your mind hold the most promise in the, the sort of aging services or care at home space? Who wants to start on that one? I'll jump in and I, um, just the first thing that comes to my mind, obviously I love the, the innovations that we're hearing from the folks on the call today, but if I think about kind of other things that get me excited, um, I, you know, I, as I see patients on a regular basis um, through CareBridge, um, you know, I still think there's a, a, an issue with loneliness and isolation in the aging population. And I think if I think about kind of what's different with our youth, uh, I've got teenagers, like their community exists around, you know, technology and social media. Obviously there's good and bad to that, but, but for the most part, my kids, there's a lot of good to that. So one of them, it's all around her local community and, and, and access to things. I, my, I have one kid who her community is worldwide and, you know, accesses friends and networks that way. And so it would really be neat if we could figure out a way for um, the aging population to connect with community in those ways um, to help, you know, some of the loneliness and isolation issues we see um, in the aging population. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. You know, I have a, a teen and um, I think about how much more difficult I think the pandemic would have been for her if she did not have her extended net her extended virtual network right mm -hmm. that she, i mean that virtual interaction like you say it can have its pros and cons but <laughs> but by and large in that type of a situation in particular it did help ameliorate uh the loneliness right um and 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 that is such an important issue but but, but she grew into that type of a virtual that's right and the right. aging well, not so much that's right that's right i think that's right jessica but I, I mean, I love that focus, Melinda, um, and I totally agree with that. I mean, what comes to mind for me is just um, the focus on engagement, like just any tool that gets engagement, because you can have the greatest solution, you could be solving the biggest problem, if, but if no one uses it, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the most promising tools is the one um, that really comes from a deep understanding of really the dynamics that are happening in the home where people are not necessarily always paid to do what they're supposed to do, but there's a natural dynamic that occurs. You have to know the players, you know, need to know the, the, the roles, the nuances. And so it's this anthropological approach that we always bring to I don't care, like from the, the, the complete flow to the words we choose, to the colors, you know, the cultural differences in caregiving. I mean, mm -hmm. caregiving is deeply cultural. And if you don't understand that, people will not adopt it. Um, I remember studying, and Afik, you, you mentioned this, you know, the monitoring tools. And I remember um, you know, studying why monitoring devices were failing in adoption. And um, my perspective from all of that is because they failed to understand that older adults do not want to be watched. They still want their sense of independence. They want a sense of dignity. And if you ignore that, you can have the best tracking tool, but they're going to turn it off. So it's not going to solve the problem. And so, you know, this is where my direct to consumer and a lot of our team DNA is direct to consumer, because at the end of the day, in the home, these are individual lives who act as consumers. And so I think the other aspect is, can you treat them like a consumer? Like, you know, like we all mentioned, their expectations are higher. If you are a transportation and medical transportation business, you're competing with Uber. If you're a medical supplies business, you're competing with Amazon. You know, these higher expectations of what people want to use in the home have to be taken into consideration. And if you have engagement, then the sky's the limit in how you can really impact what's happening in the home because they're actually trusting you and interacting with you and you have their attention. And I think yeah. attention today is key. So how do you go about approaching integrating cultural awareness like into um, your technology tools? Um, you know, I, I think you're right that, that, you know, there are cultural aspects of caregiving um, that, I, I mean, I hadn't necessarily thought about it directly before, but, but um, you know, for example, you know, I'm gonna use my mother's from the South, right? And, and what do you do when someone, when you wanna express care for someone, you bring them food, yes. like for sure food, food, food. How do you kind of, uh, you know, how do you identify, and this is for, for any of you, Jessica, since you raised it, but for anyone, how do you sort of identify cultural aspects that may play into caregiving? 
Well, I think there are several different things. Um, deeply passionate about this, but like one is even in the actual solution. And so I remember going into caregiving and a lot of the solutions were just how do it's placement, it's elder care placement. Where am I going to place you? Even mm -hmm. that solution alone, it takes out a lot of different cultures where some cultures would never place their elder person anywhere. They, it's going to happen in the home. So then there were no solutions for that. So even the type of solution is deeply embedded in our cultural values. Um, and then to your point, uh, you know, how do people express care? Um, and you know, being a platform where even with meals, we actually, it's not just, I'm going to bring a meal and whatever you want, it's going to bring, like we actually have these selections and include all the different types of cultural cultural options or different you know types of foods um, and then you can select your own and so even in those nuances you know um, I'm not going to just bring you chicken soup like we have this Filipino soup or this Korean soup and I can put that in there in my offer so you just have this platform that's very culturally aware and flexible enough um, but still makes it efficient and very clear so awesome any other thoughts on that? I think, did you want to weigh in on types of tech tools? Yeah, so, so I think that there is the stuff that exists today. And I think probably the, the biggest stuff that I see is actually things that have some cognitive support. So my best example for that is actually things like masterclass that are amazingly well done. So my mom is 78 and she sits with this masterclass and she takes notes and she can, she can spend days with that. And that, in my mind, is amazing. So I also use Masterclass for my uh, for my for work, but she was able to find her a whole world. And while I'm not sure that this is a solution for this is really a solution for social isolation, I think the jury is really out on that one. But in terms of learning, ongoing learning, cognitive abilities, mm -hmm. uh, cognitive training, and not the lumosity type of stuff, but this, I think this is real. This is out there, definitely not utilized enough, but I think huge boosts uh, with COVID. So that's probably one of the more prominent technologies in my mind in terms of uh, successful aging. I would say that remote patient monitoring is also for some use cases. I would probably say home hospital is, is a good one that's super important for successful aging. And I think that's going to grow with technology. So, and I hope that uh, the recovery and rehabilitation that will follow after that will follow in the same uh, path. And that's super um, critical for uh, successful aging. A visual and hearing impairment, uh, gadgets, devices that connect to the app, to the media, all already out there, already very helpful, very good. And I wouldn't say they're very cheap, but they are, but they are attainable at least uh, for some. So these are the things that I believe are out there, you know, very uh, helpful. Rest is unfortunately in my mind, not so much. I do think though that the future looks better. I don't know if it's a future five years from now, or 10 years from now, but the biggest thing that I'm seeing that can potentially revolutionize the space is exoskeletons and all of those devices where you can actually wear on yourself and use the technology and robotics to augment functionality that you've lost with aging, all the way from being able to walk to being able to shower on your own and so on and so forth. And I think that is already it's out there from technology. It's in the use of the army and other places, but it still has not really crossed the, let's call that innovation chasm to, to be used at homes. But this is probably the first thing that in my mind will start changing the equation of what you have to do with a human caregivers versus what you can, functionality you can bring back to the, to the individual. So I think that's in a nutshell. Yeah, so many amazing opportunities out uh, out there. You know, I was just thinking about virtual uh, virtual reality, right, as a component of engagement, and uh, you know, especially for for folks who are stuck at home because they can't be out and about um, as much anymore. Um, having some virtual reality experiences to you know uh, to engage and stimulate their mind and, and what they're doing is that's also a neat opportunity. Um, okay, so I want to turn to each of you and ask you to give us a quick sneak peek into what is next for your company. So Melinda, tell us what you can uh, about what, what's next for CareBridge. Um, well, primarily CareBridge will be expanding to additional states um, with um, additional uh, um, health plan partners. 
um, but also looking at additional populations. So um, we already serve a, a, a number of individuals with intellectual disability, but uh, we think that there's some unique things that we might want to change and, um, and uh, add to our service to service that population. So individuals with disability, and then um, certainly, um, you know, assisted living facilities where there's kind of group settings of folks who could uh, benefit from our um, our care and, and access to our services another area we'll, we'll be growing into. Excellent. Jessica, how about you? Yeah, I kind of allude to this, but we're just at this really exciting point of growth because we're seeing this momentum um, and this, you know, allocation of attention and uh, budget. And so, you know, we're really just at this point where we're working with employers, we're going to be expanding to health plans, pharma, um, just basically working with the institutions and because um, we believe this is a systemic problem. So that's why we're intentional. I see some questions up here that are like, who pays for your service? And, you know, it was a very intentional decision for us to not go directly to family caregivers and to more go um, to the institutions uh, because family caregivers are part of that and they are often overlooked because they're not part of the financial equation. And yet our society and healthcare system benefits from their service. And so we're purposely going to um, you know, the systems and having wor working ourselves into their payment um, plans to kind of act, you know, provide this as a benefit um, so the family carriers don't have to pay for it themselves. Excellent. Afik. I think for us, it's mostly, so, and we see a lot of momentum around that. So I think that's things that are going to already materialize in the beginning of 2022. But right now, we have mostly been focused on the older ages, uh, attend, attend ages of 80, 85, somewhere in, along that age group. But I think strategically for us, we believe that there is less that you can do at those ages in terms of successful aging. So a lot of, let's call that, a lot of the premature decline has already happened, or even not premature, a lot of the decline has happened. So I, where we are going next with this is we're expanding the, the scope and beginning to focus on a much younger ages a, and, and bring our services bundled and packaged with multiple others financial services in the market right now so that you're getting holistic solutions that deliver value from day one, which is um, not, I would say not the standard case for financial solutions that you purchase at those ages. So, and I believe that that will also open a lot of uh, additional opportunities when it comes to engagement, because engagement does look different at these ages than it looks in the age of 80 something. And also a lot of more opportunities for science-based intervention, because simply there is a lot more you can do. Yeah, so what I've heard from all three of you is a de desire for a solution that is integrative and comprehensive and, um, you know, it, as much of a one stop uh, as possible, taking all kinds of uh, different types of needs into account when you're providing uh, services to folks who are aging at home and their caregivers. Um, I think that is terrific because that I think I think that is exactly what the market calls for. Uh, I want to turn to a question that Jessica referenced just a moment ago. One of our uh, listeners did ask the question about for, for each of us, who pays for your product and what have been the sales cycle challenges? Um, I think that's a, a terrific question to have each of you respond to. Jessica, you talked about uh, not going direct to consumer, but instead focusing on institutional settings. Can you tell us a little bit um, about specifically what, what that looks like? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we work with employers to add this as a benefit to support their working caregivers. Um, you know, all these stats, 32% of working caregivers voluntarily leave their jobs. And so there's huge retention issues and it's mainly women. And so when we talk about all the, um, the trends of DEI and increasing and keeping more women in the workplace and leadership, we cannot address that if we don't address the caregiving needs. Um, and so there are, uh, we help them stay more productive overall, uh, healthier, um, and we've proven 83% increase of zero time off and 30% decrease of stress reduction, and then 17% increase of employer loyalty, and we've saved $10,000 of personal savings. And that was a formal study that was done. Um, and so that's how we serve and work with employers. Um, and then, uh, you know, you have health plans where there are caregivers who may or may not be working um, and it's one, their own health as well as impacting the health of their loved one. 
uh, they may uh, be on that plan or not. So there's Medicare Advantage and you know um, other health plans uh, that we'll be working with. Um, and there it's the more effective care, higher satisfaction of care, lowering the cost of care. Now, of course, some of those things take longer time to prove out, but there are still more immediate things that we can um, show the impact of uh, using our platform and tracking everything. And that's the other advantage of technology. Yeah, I'm glad to hear you mention a study about that, that you all are, you know, are doing this, are, are making sure you're collecting your data on around how this is working. Um, you know, it, it seems intuitive that employees really do appreciate mm -hmm. uh, their employer recognizing some of the challenges they face in the rest of their lives. And, uh, and you know, outside of work, and uh, you know, appreciate having that kind of a resource. And certainly, we all know that if we've got something intense going on at home, it's difficult to focus at work. So, you know, if we have other tools to deal with that, that's got to be a benefit, right? Yeah. Melinda, how about you? Um, so, our primary um, uh, clients or customers are health plans. We also do some direct to state. Um, but those are typically, um, so in a number of states, the managed long-term care services are through, um, you know, the, the primary health insurers that exist out there. Um, and so that's who our primary customer is right now. Got it. That makes sense. And Afik, how about you? We talked about, you mentioned when you were discussing your company, um, uh, that the long-term care insurance companies are, uh, a target market for you all. Are there uh, are there others, and and how do you approach specifically those those long term care insurers? How, what kind of evidence do you come at them with that this is a good thing for them to do? Yeah, so we are we began solely with a long term care insurance carriers, and and now we are expanding beyond that to essentially I would say any. Uh, there is no official market segmentation here, but it's, let's call it pre-retirement and retirement financial solution uh, providers. So that's financial companies and, and insurance companies that sell solutions around retirement income and so on and so forth. So expanded a bit more beyond. It's under the umbrella of life and health insurance. So that's to answer uh, that question. Uh, what we provide them with is from the data that we collect and, and the engagement and everything else uh, that we do with their blocks, we of course provide them and extrapolate that to their blocks. Long term, we have actuaries on staff that help so-called translate the healthcare result and the outcomes into actuary so-called lingo and, um, and the things that they care about and also people that focus on sales and distribution that help uh, those that we partner with on new efforts and for the younger population to push those to market. So this is a proper, what's called a B2B2C in many ways. So the buyer, our buyer, and I think much like uh, Jessica, our buyer is, is an institution. In our specific case, it's financial such insurance. And, uh, but the, the people that actually receive a lot of the benefits of the solution are in the policyholders, consumers. So this is a related question that comes from our audience. Uh, and it's, it's a very good observation. So many times the you know, extended target market is the, the family members or the caregivers themselves. So support for them in, in helping them on their caregiving role. Is anyone actually uh, selling directly to older adults who themselves need support services or is that a different market entirely? Yeah, I would say what Jessica and Afik have said, like we, we our client our, is to a health plan, but at the end of the day, we have to engage um, the person in the home. So we're not selling to the person in the home as far as them having to give us their credit card, but we do have to make the service, um, you know, user-friendly, easy to use and, and worthwhile to them so that they then um, engage with us. So for us, it's, it's less of a sale and more of an engagement um, measurement. And we have, uh, you know, very high engagement. Obviously people are um, excited to have uh, easy access to care in their home. Um, and, and services uh, available to them in the way that we're able to provide, so. Well, and they're probably also relieved to have some support for their family members, you know, or, or others close to them who are providing care for them. I know that, you know, no one wants to feel like a burden, right? Especially to your children. 
Uh, and so I suspect that some of those services that, that your tools are providing is, is a bit of a relief to them. For sure. All right, so let me look at our other questions here. Um, <laughs> we're talking about the Panini uh, generation here. So, okay, COVID-19 has shown not just a need for assistance with at-home care of the elderly, but for more assistance with at-home care of kids as well. As the name suggests, the Panini generation holds the care for both. Is there any application for any of your companies in the chronic needs or post-procedure pediatric care space? Great question. Different population. Yeah, I'll just jump in. That's exactly um, one of the additional populations that we're, um, we're growing in. So uh, not necessarily post-procedure, but the chronic. Uh, so there are a, a population of kids who are on long-term services through step, state Medicaid plans. Um, and, uh, and so that's a, a population that we uh, will be serving later this year as well in some states. Yeah, and we absolutely, um, we're about a 60-40 split, like 40% 40 of the actual patients are not elder care, um, and it's children. Uh, and, you know, it's, it, again, it's like the similar, they actually are some of the most engaged because they have all the school parents and they have built in communities already. And so we're just a platform that kind of puts it all together and, and mobilizes it. Um, so, yeah, and I think it's, it's interesting. This question is interesting because um, there are so many roles that one person holds. So the caregiver for the person who's, you know, the elderly person is often the caregiver then for um, the other people in their lives. And it's not that, it, I wish it, if we all took turns that only one person in the family can get sick at one time, but it often doesn't <laughs> happen like that. So, you know, it's a great question because that's reality. Yeah, I'm, um, that's interesting, Jessica, that you're at about a 60-40 split. I think everyone's mind sometimes intuitively goes, you know, to, especially when you're in the healthcare context, to aging uh, parents, right? But that is abs it is absolutely the case that there are needs beyond that. And, um, you know, you can be stuck sort of balancing, balancing both of those needs. All right. All right uh, one last question from the audience. And then if we have time, I'm going to buzz around and ask one other thing of you. Um, how does data fuel measurability and visibility into each of the problems your companies are trying to solve? Uh, Afik, I think you got at this. Um, uh, a little bit, but anything else you want to add? Yeah, no, I think what's really important is that we do this, and, and unfortunately it's not been done in this space for a long amount of time, is that we, we do this seriously. And we take it the same level of rigor and the same level of standards as we would approach healthcare problems such as clinical trials and so on and so forth. I think a good learning uh, framework of how not to do it is how the wellness employer wellness industry acted in the past. And I think that's definitely something to avoid. Uh, I think that we are tracking data on everything that is happening very rigorously. We are analyzing, we're designing the trials, we are balancing, we're investing a lot of energy into that because even if we are not seeing so let's call it, it's not kind of like packaged into the pricing at this moment, because we believe that this is long-term IP and it will worth it because figuring out, helping people understand that there is a lot of things that they can do at the age of 60 that actually work and at the age of 65 and at the age of 70, 75, 80, and so on and so forth. From our standpoint, this is IP, this is important. This is, by the way, important, not just for us, important for society. And we don't believe that there is a way of showing that it works and, and definitely, by the way, showing that it has financial impact because, by the way, a lot of things work and, and so like people are happy and they report that they are happy, but it doesn't really change anything that would, would be financially viable to anybody. And so showing that it works, showing that it has the financial savings, that is the core. More than anything else, that is the core of what we do. Everything else is, is just a, a means to an end, of course, and, and driving value, but it's a means to an end because that's the driver of improvement of these type of methods. Yeah, the data is just critical, you know, appropriately gathering it and analyzing it is absolutely uh, one of the most important things a company can do. Okay, real quickly, before we sign off, if you were granted one wish for changing something in the caregiving space, what would it be? Who wants uh, to go first, Jessica? Go ahead, Jessica. Well, I'll be quick here. Just, um, I would just love to decentralize 
care from the hospital and build a structure of community-centered care. I mean, that's what we're all about, um, you know, to really empower the personal social circles, fund local resources, and put monetary value on all the non-clinical aspects of care. Um, so just, uh, you know, I think it's going in this direction, but more and more emphasis and rigor around the social determinants of health, for sure. Terrific. Afik, yeah. Melinda? I, I, know, I would be, it's just that people know that there is so much out there that could be done at any age that they can do it. And I'm, caregiving is, is very different in various ages, but even like the family, like the spouse and can help each other even at the age of 60 to do something. Yes, it's not the full-fledged caregiving that we've been talking here. There is so much things that they can do and that people know that and start acting upon that. That's my only wish. Mm -hmm. The little things make a difference, right? All right, mm -hmm. Melinda, wrap us yeah. up. I'll just say selfishly as a provider, I'd love to see continued improvement in healthcare information portability. A lot of people have tried to solve this. I think, you know, Google had a solution where you could get up, but it just, it is very challenging unless you're in certain regional areas that have great HIE for um, information as a provider to know, you know, what lab tests have already been done, what were previous test results in a way that's easy to digest. Um, that would be my magic wand. I think we would save millions and millions of dollars um, at, for U.S. healthcare um, by duplicate care that gets provided, and uh, and all of us docs would be a lot smarter because we'd have a lot of background information that we we don't always have when we see patients. So not related to the solution we provide, but but that's my wish for a, for a magic wand. Agreed and understood for sure. I know many doctors, many physicians share share that desire. Yeah. All right. So we'll, well, that will close us out today. Thank you so much to each of you for joining us and for uh, sharing your insights and just in general for the work that you are doing on behalf of caregivers to help caregivers and the, and the folks that they are supporting. Thanks to the HLTH Foundation for sponsoring this. Again, I'm Carrie Nixon, and I will look forward, hopefully, to running across all of you again soon.